Welcome, everybody, and good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, Pastor Ben Weekman. Uh, I serve up at Peace in uh, Upper North Mankato. I've been there for about a year and a half, uh, and last year in this rotation, uh, my co-pastor uh, was in the rotation, so he came down here. So even though I live like a block and a half away from you guys, I've never actually been in the building here at St. Mark. So it's a, it's a great privilege for me to, to join you here tonight uh, to celebrate the fellowship and the unity and faith that, that we have with one another uh, and to, to hear God's word uh, along with you here this evening. Uh, tonight we're going to continue our midweek Lenten series, uh, which is baptized into his death. Uh, we're looking at uh, the, the biblical doctrine, the biblical teaching of baptism, taking a deep dive into that. And tonight we're talking about uh, our deep need for baptism. Who is baptism for? Who needs it? How necessary uh, is it? We'll talk about that, that original sin that makes us uh, incompatible with God uh, by nature and how Jesus has made us compatible, how he has covered up that sin for us by his death. Uh, so may he bless us as we hear his word here together this evening. Uh, our service begins in your bulletin. Uh, you can find uh, the, on page one. Uh, we'll continue with uh, prayer at the close of the day.
Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver and restore us, that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in the newness of life. Amen. Our Passion History lesson for this evening is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14. I will read beginning at verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the passion history of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. These uh, midweek Lenten services have always been uh, some of my favorite services to attend each year. Uh, maybe that's not quite the, the case when I was super little, when my parents told me we were going to two church services a week, uh, but I've really grown to uh, appreciate them and, and grew to love them. Uh, they're a great reminder to step back and, and just take a breath, right? A, a reminder to not let the craziness of our schedules, of our, our daily, our, our weekly lives 
crowd out that, that one thing needful, the most important thing. But as you've heard now, this year we're doing something a little bit different, uh, for us at least, but still very Lutheran in these midweek services. We're, we're using these Lenten services to talk in greater depth about the doctrine, the, the biblical teaching of baptism. And so throughout uh, these midweek Wednesday night services, we're really emphasizing the, the teaching of baptism while still uh, emphasizing the, the, the passion of our Savior, how he lived for us and, and died for us. Uh, so, so far you here at St. Mark have heard last week about the power of baptism. You're going to hear about what, what baptism is, what, what a blessing it is, what it means for us, how it is not just for us when we're, when we're, child, when we're children, when we're infants, but how we carry those blessings of our baptism with us through our whole life. Uh, and tonight we talk about the why. As Christians, you understand the, the, the basics of baptism. You understand that, that it's a good thing, it's a gift from God, but, but do we really need it? Uh, who is baptism for? How necessary is it? Uh, tonight our emphasis is on the fact that baptism is absolutely needed by all. And, and before we get into it too far, I, I think we need to, to really focus on that, to emphasize that, that baptism is necessary and how, how difficult of a teaching this is, how unsettling of a fact that can be. That, that baptism isn't just an extra blessing, it's not just on top of everything else, it's not just an added bonus for us, but it is absolutely essential. It is needed by every single person. That is an unsettling truth for a few reasons. In our text for tonight, Jesus says that in order to go to heaven, in order to see the kingdom of God, you have to be reborn. You have to be reborn. It is an absolute necessity. It is impossible for you to go to heaven as you are. You need new spiritual life. So understand what this means. Jesus is saying very clearly, you are not good enough. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done or haven't done in your life, you are not good enough. You have, you have failed. You are morally bankrupt. You are, are legally guilty before God. And spiritually speaking, by nature, you are dead. And, and that's unsettling because we like to think of ourselves as pretty good people, right? Uh, especially as we compare ourselves to others, especially as we read the news and, and read about all the terrible things people do, or we compare ourselves to other people in our life and we see how they have hurt us, how they have hurt others in, in, in their community and in, in their life too. We think, I'm, I'm a pretty good person, right? I'm not overtly evil, I go to church pretty routinely. I go to church twice a week here in Lent, right? Uh, I, overall, I'm, I'm better than at least half the people I know, if not better than, than most of the people I know. And so it's unsettling to hear straight from Jesus that, that even as you are, despite what you think of, of yourself, you are not enough. Another reason it's unsettling is because when Jesus says this, he's telling you that not only are you not good enough, but that there is nothing you can do to change that. That's unsettling, right? That I can't make this rebirth, this new spiritual life happen, so I have to rely on someone else to do it for me. Right? I am not in control of my own destiny. I have to, to trust someone outside of me to do it for me. There's nothing I can do to make myself more attractive to God. There's nothing that I can do to make him love me. It's totally up to his mercy and his grace to give me this gift of rebirth that's necessary for me to go to heaven. So that's unsettling because we need God to want to give us rebirth, right? We need him to want to show us this, this grace and this mercy, to give us this new life, while at the same time knowing that there is nothing good that lives within us, that is within our sinful nature. And I know that you understand what a wonderful blessing baptism is, but to truly understand how wonderful of a gift this is, we have to know how much we need it. And to understand that better, we have our text here tonight from the Gospel of John. And the, the setting is, is, is interesting because it's dark and mysterious. A, a guy comes to Jesus in the dark of night under the, the cover, the shroud of darkness so that nobody knows that he's talking to him. And it's not just any man, but it's a, a Pharisee, a, a, a leader in the, the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And, and our text for tonight is the conversation between these two men. It's from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Uh, this is printed for you on page 4 in your bulletin. I invite you to please rise for the reading of the gospel. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to see Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, 
We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And dear Heavenly Father, these words are yours, and so we know that they are the truth. And we ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. So the main point that we take away from this text here tonight is in connection with with who Nicodemus is and what Jesus reveals about him, what what Jesus says about him. Uh, As a Pharisee, Nicodemus was extremely concerned with piety. Uh, So that means that when it comes to religion, when it came to God's law, uh, Nicodemus went to the greatest lengths imaginable to follow all the rules. That's what the Pharisees were known for. Uh, they, they made new rules that were more extreme than, than God's rules and his law uh, as a buffer. They said, we don't want to cross over God's laws, so we're going to make our own laws so we don't even get close to stepping over that line. And not only is he a Pharisee, but he's, he's from John's description here, a, a member of the Grand Sanhedrin of Jerusalem. Uh, so this is a, a position of power, a position of, of respect among the Jews. This guy is one of the best of the best. And the first thing Jesus says to him is, nope, you're not good enough. He says, you want to see the kingdom of heaven? You want to see God? What you need is not less sin. What you need is not to to be better. What you need is to be reborn. What you need is to stop being spiritually dead. Right? You don't don't need to try harder. You don't need to be uh, more zealous. You need spiritual life, and you don't have it. Good actions, being a morally good person, does not equal spiritual life. So doing the right thing, living the right life, does not grant us access into the kingdom of God. And if Jesus says this about the best of the best, then he means it about us too, all of us. What is needed is not more piety. What is needed is not more rule following. What Nicodemus needed, what we all need, is for God to unite himself with us. For God to do to us spiritually what he did to Adam physically. We need God to breathe spiritual life into our lives and our hearts to make us alive with him. We said earlier that one of the things that makes the need for baptism unsettling is our our utter and total dependence on God's desire to save us. We need him to want to save us. We need him to want to pour out his love, his forgiveness, and his mercy on us. This is only unsettling, though, if we are not quite sure about what the nature of God is. And we do know the nature of God. We are sure. Because not only does he tell us what his nature is, he, he shows it, too. Right? Read from, this is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. The Bible tells us this. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant that he promised to your fathers with an oath. From Lamentations 3, by the mercies of the Lord, we are not consumed. For his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. And in Exodus, God is is talking about his own name. He's declaring to his people what his nature is, what he is like. And he says this about himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and overflowing with mercy and truth, maintaining mercy for thousands, forgiving guilt and rebellion and sin. But even more than than speaking his nature, God has shown it to us. And nowhere has he shown his his nature of of being a God that is slow to anger and compassionate and gracious than on the cross. Within God, there is such a great love and grace, such a deep desire to uh, to give you spiritual life, such a deep desire to have you be in his presence forever, eternally in his kingdom. 
that he sent his son to be your substitute. He sent Jesus to go through everything that you're going to hear about again this Lenten season. All of the betrayal and slander and torture and death and even hell so that you can have spiritual life. The thing that is necessary to be with him forever in his kingdom. Jesus lived and died and rose so that you could be forgiven and enter the kingdom of God. When we understand that that is the nature of the God that that we worship, the one true God, when we understand that, that that is the nature of the God that we depend on, our dependency on him is not something that's unsettling. It's, it's a huge comfort for us. The nature of God is love. His desire is that no one experiences eternal spiritual death, but that we would repent and live. We can only do that. We can only repent and believe in Jesus when we are spiritually alive and God has chosen baptism to make that happen for us. Jesus tells Nicodemus, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. So now we know two things. We know that, that God has a deep desire for you to be in a, in a relationship, to, for you to have a unity with him, for you to have spiritual life. And we know that he has chosen baptism as a means to give you this spiritual life. So do you think that this blessing should be reserved only for those who are older than, than 12 years old? Because there's some debate, but 13 years old is generally considered what is known to be the age of accountability. And, and it's understood that, that this is the age at which children can distinguish what is right from what is wrong. They can make the, the, the right decision to do what God wants you to do. And since they can distinguish right from wrong, they can now make the decision that they want to be baptized. Now, this false teaching, it comes from a complete misunderstanding of what baptism is and does. And the misunderstanding is that baptism is something that we do for God. So the logic is that, is that as, a, as a young person, if I'm 13 years old and, and I have made the decision that I want to worship God, that, that I want to follow him, I need to, to show the world, I need to show God that I'm serious. And baptism is how I do that. Baptism is my sign that I mean business, that I'm going to try to my best to walk in God's ways, that I'm going to dedicate my life to him. But scripture clearly teaches us that baptism is, is the opposite of this. Right? Baptism is not something that we do for God. Baptism is something that God does for us. Right? Look what Jesus is, is telling Nicodemus. He's saying that by nature, there is no one who is righteous. Right? Even the best of the best is born spiritually dead. And, and as people who are spiritually dead, we can't choose him. We can't choose to follow him. And the only way to become spiritually alive is to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, to be united with him in baptism. So you need to be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And that is true of, of adults and children alike. Children need forgiveness just as much as anybody else. I've been blessed uh, with four children uh, between the ages right now of, of three and ten. Uh, two boys, two girls. And, and for none of them, I have not had to teach any one of them how to be selfish. Right? That's not a lesson that I had to sit down and talk to them about. I haven't... I haven't had to teach him how to lie, right? I haven't said, hey, if you tell me that you brushed your teeth when you didn't brush your teeth, sometimes I won't notice and you won't have to brush your teeth. Uh, that's, that just comes naturally to them, right? Uh, my kids, if, if, so, if one of their siblings grabs something out of their hand, I have not taught them to smack their sibling and sometimes they'll, they'll hand the, the toy back because they're, they're injured or, or hurt and say, wow, you're serious, here it is. I've not taught any of my kids, as far as I know, to, to do these things. And yet they do it, right? Because they are, are born sinful. That, that sinful nature is already inside of them. And, and baptism, so, so unity with God through faith in Jesus that comes from baptism, that is the solution to sin, right? We need an, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that exists outside of us to be given to us. And baptism is how that happens. Nowhere in scripture does, does it limit who this promise is for, it never says that baptism is for this select group of people. Baptism is needed and intended for everybody, little children included. Jesus teaches this, this Pharisee, a man that according to all appearances is one of the best of the best, that the imperfect cannot create the perfect. Right? So sinful parents give birth to, to sinful 
children. It's always going to be that way. It is only the Spirit who can give birth to Spirit, the Spirit who can give spiritual life. And, and Scripture clearly teaches that this happens through the gift of baptism, through the power of His Word, of God's Word, connected with water as it is applied to a sinner's head. And it's through that incredible gift that, that He clothes us with the righteousness of Christ, that He opens to us the kingdom of heaven. So baptism is absolutely needed by all. But also we need to, to step back and recognize the, the sovereignty of God, the fact that God is God and that he can do what he, what he wills in whatever manner he wills it done. And so baptism is necessary, but there are people who are saved outside of, of being baptized. And the, the best example in Scripture is the thief on the cross. Uh, God worked through his word alone, not connected with water in that situation. Uh, he, he, that thief heard the word of God pronounced from God himself as he's being crucified on the cross next to the Savior of the world. And, and that, that word created faith in that man's heart. And we are told that, that he now inhabits paradise. He inherited the gift of paradise with Jesus. So we, regarding the necessity of baptism, I've heard it said this way, that baptism isn't necessary for salvation, but that it is necessary. So it's not necessary for salvation, but it is absolutely indeed necessary. It is an incredible, beautiful, powerful gift from our God that is needed by and intended for all people. A gift from God that brings comfort and assurance and spiritual life so that we, who were born spiritually dead, who were born as the enemies of God, can not only see that kingdom of God, but live in that kingdom with him forever. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. The peace which surpasses all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we join together in our Lenten hymn, which is printed for you on page 5.
This time now we'll collect our offering. Oh. 
Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Well, again, good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks so much for letting me be here with you to, to celebrate the joy that is ours through faith in Christ, the unity uh, that we share together. Uh, I don't think there's any special announcements or anything this evening, uh, so until we meet again, the Lord's blessings to all of you.